uh, in and from First Hollywood Presbyterian Church this uh, Sunday, the 27th of September. And we're delighted and encouraged that you can join with us this morning, especially those who are here for the first time among us. We're also delighted to welcome Reverend Alistair Kennedy back to the pulpit here. Uh, last time he preached from here uh, was our communion service on Sunday the 15th of March, uh, two days before all services and church activities were stopped. Uh, so we're glad that he could come to uh, strengthen and encourage us again now. And obviously we hope for better things following uh, this Sunday's service. Um, the, he's preaching from Psalm 27, which is, Do Not Be Afraid. Um, uh, I'd like to thank Jenny and Zoe and Charles for leading us in our worship this morning. And I would remind you that during the two uh, sung pieces in the service, we remain seated. Uh, we can sing softly and whilst masked. Uh, I recognise that there are those that are exempt from wearing masks, uh, and that's fine. But in that case, please do not sing out. Uh, I thank the welcome team as well for helping us be here this morning and we really need people to volunteer for that for October so if you feel able to do that please speak with Albert uh, to help us uh, with that. There's no offering during the service, it's lifted, uh, there's the opportunity on the way out. I will have a vacancy announcement to make at the end of the service so I will speak further to you on that. At that point. Now let us continue in our worship of God together. Greg, thank you for the welcome. It's a strange experience, uh, all sitting in your family groups. Uh, I thought my wife might like to sit up here in the pulpit with me, but uh, she, she didn't fancy that, so she's sitting on her own. We're here to worship God, and I want to center our worship um, today around Psalm 27. And to begin, begin with the two verses from that psalm that for me express both uh, our faith, and my faith and yours, and why, why we love to be here. Psalm 27, verse one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> God our Father, you are the light of our lives. You are our salvation. For our salvation is in your work in our lives. Our salvation is in knowing you, in experiencing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ by which our sins are forgiven and we are adopted and received into your family, the family of your people, those whom you love in a very special way. Lord, we, we love the house of God. We love to come together. This place is special, but even more special is the fellowship of those who we love in the Lord with whom we meet, and together we come to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Lord, come to us in the power of your Holy Spirit today, we pray, that we may indeed gaze upon the beauty of the Lord in all the awesomeness of your greatness, high and holy and lifted up, and in all the wonder of your grace, stooping down to us, even to become incarnate and be our Savior, going to the cross for our sins, sharing in our weakness, our suffering, our need. 
Lord, visit us today. When we come into your holy presence, we are immediately made aware of how sinful we are, of how unworthy we are. We come, Lord, in that sinfulness to the fountain where there is cleansing. We come to Jesus, our great high priest, who has offered himself on our behalf. We come, O oh God, confessing our sin and claiming that right to forgiveness that he has purchased for us with his own blood. Lord, pardon us, cleanse us. Lift from us the clouds that so easily shadow between us and your presence and grant us the joy the fullness of joy of being in the Spirit on the Lord's day and in the peace and blessing of our God. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we join together um, to sing um, quietly behind your, your masks, but to sing together that great hymn, My Hope Is... But now you have to be careful when you're a preacher, how you announce this hymn. Many years ago, when I was young and inexperienced, I said, now let us sing, my hope is built on nothing. But our hope is not built on nothing. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Now, boys and girls, Jenny is going to lead you in the kids' slot. Well, boys and girls, it is so lovely to see you this morning. I can see a few in here from behind my special glass screen. 
well, perspex screen. It's good to see you. I thought I'd try something at risk of the clerk of session going mad at me. Boys and girls, for those of you who are in the hall, do you want to give us a cheer so we can hear you? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, good to hear you. I know that you're in the hall, we're in here, but hopefully we can see each other in the car park together afterwards at a distance. Um, I don't know if there are any birthdays this morning. I know of one, um, little Freya Hughes, I think is uh, four or five this morning. Um, I'm not sure if she's out. I wanted to remind you, boys and girls, when we, um, when we did all of the services online, we promised those of you who'd had a birthday in that, in that time, the opportunity to get something from the birthday bucket. Well, uh, we have made up, Nicola in the office has made up little birthday bags with some treats in them. So if you have had your birthday during that time, if you can meet me outside the doors of the worship center afterwards, I would really, really love to uh, give you um, one of those birthday bags to celebrate your birthday. Um, I want to talk to you. Before I do that, I'd really like to just pray for you. Father, thank you for the boys and girls of our congregation. Um, it is so, it is just such a delight um, to see so many back at church on a Sunday morning. And we may not be able to all see each other when we're sitting in the service, but Father, we thank you that we all meet here together in your presence. And I want to pray your blessing on the boys and girls this morning. Amen. Well, boys and girls, Alistair is going to come and speak to us today on Psalm 27, which talks about do not be afraid. And on one of the sheets that um, was sent out to you, um, there was a memory verse challenge. Now, some of the boys and girls might have seen this, some might not. So I want to read you um, a little verse from Psalm 27. It's verse 14, and it says, wait patiently for the Lord, be brave, and courageous, yes, wait patiently for the Lord. And I always think, well, you might not put those two words together. Um, if you're called to be brave, you maybe imagine a soldier going out to battle. Um, and if you're asked to be patient, it sometimes means sitting really quietly. I know that I'm often asking our girls to be patient. And that usually means I'm asking them to sit really quietly. But this passage tells us to wait patiently on the Lord, but also to be brave and courageous. So it's telling us that when we wait patiently for God to do stuff in our lives, for him to move and act on our behalf, it takes a lot of bravery and courage on our part. It takes bravery to trust God to work things out in his time and in his way. So we're called to be patient. This week, our session have interviewed people um, for the, the position of minister in our church. And that was meant to happen back in March. Um, but then lockdown happened and those interviews weren't able to happen so they've just happened now and God tells us that sometimes we have to be brave and we have to be uh, be patient so we've had to be patient for that to happen and at the end of the service Craig will come and will talk to us about what's happened in the past week but boys and girls that's something that some that we can all be excited about, um, from the oldest in the congregation to the youngest. So I would really love for you to, to think about this verse this week, boys and girls. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Thank you very much. 
and uh, it's good to see uh, boys and girls scattered throughout the congregation. Actually, I'm surprised at uh, how f- full looking the church looks, and uh, hello to those who are uh, watching in the, and listening in the church hall as well. We come now to our Bible reading. One of the most important things in any worship service is the reading of God's Word. And I want to talk to you this morning about fear, because fear is a great problem. And um, it, it's particularly rife, I think, at the moment. I know some people who are scared to go out of their homes, uh, but it's a much bigger problem than that. So let's listen um, to Psalm 27, where David actually has a lot to be scared of. Hear the word of God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not hand me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And this is God's word for us today. And he will bless it. Psalm 27. um, What I want to to share with you is, is, is what I would call antidotes to fear. And um, I suppose an illustration of that is this uh, most famous of of modern pictures, um, Edward Munch's The Scream. Um, Now, to me, it's not a great picture, but it's one of the most valuable pictures in the world. And that face um, says it all, the scream of, of fear. Fear is something very real in almost human life. It has a, it has a positive, a very positive purpose. But fear can get out of control and so easily does. We fear what might happen. Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Bell Graham, um, said, God never gives grace for imaginary troubles. When troubles come, there is grace. When, we're just worrying, when you're just worrying about what might come, there's no help from God because it's not real. It's actually, it's actually sin, worrying about what might happen. And it can possess us, can take us over. When I was uh, 
just barely out of my teens in my very early 20s, my father died. I was 21. He died of a heart attack. And I became possessed with the fear that I was going to take a heart attack and die. That sounds silly, but it was very real to me. I could not get rid of this thought until I learned to trust God and to tell God that I knew I was in his hands. Someday I would die, but I was in his love and care. And it was practicing that thought every time the fear arose that got me out of it. Fear, when we allow it to take possession of us, is a force. It's a force that is destructive of all your, all your progress in faith and discipleship. All that you may have experienced in Jesus, once that fear grips you and, and dominates you, it's all lost to you. It hides the face of God from you. It's an enemy. Do you know fear is a terrible thing? Fear makes people do awful things. People who are scared of an enemy will, will rise up in, in atrocities. We've seen that in Northern Ireland. We've seen it in former Yugoslavia. We've seen it in Rwanda. We've seen it in many places. Fear of another community causes dreadful things to happen. And on a smaller personal scale, it leads to spiteful acts against others. It darkens the face of God. Now, King David knew fear. King David knew real fear. He had a lot to be afraid of because he lived in a brutal age. And as you read through Psalm 27, you, you, you can find all the things that he says, evil men against, advance against me to devour my flesh. My enemies and my foes attack me. An army besiege me. War breaks out against me. The day of trouble. Enemies surround me. He speaks about my oppressors. The desire of my foes. False witnesses who breathe out violence. So David lives a troubled life insecure life. His life hangs by a thread on many occasions. But he says, my heart will not fear. I will be confident. Now this on David's part is a deliberate choice to be proactive against fear's power over him. And that's how we tackle this spiritual foe that can so easily attack us. So what are David's antidotes to fear? Well, I, I find, as you would expect, but there are there, there, three strategies in this psalm that David takes against fear. And the first of those strategies is to keep himself in the presence of God through worship. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. The most fundamental thing for David is to keep the reality of God burning bright before him. Because it is when we lose sight of the Lord that we become prey to fear and other things as well. When we leave ourselves alone and our vision of the Lord and our, our faith in Jesus wanes, then we're left alone. And we imagine what might happen and there's no help, as Ruth Bell, Bell Graham said. When bad things do happen, and, and bad things uh, 
can happen to Christians as to everyone else when they do happen. Well, as Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? In everything, God is there to work for us. You cannot have the bright presence of the Lord around you and be in any doubt then that that God will look after you, that you are in his care. Whatever happens, he is with you to bring you through it and through the darkest hour that comes to us all at the end to bring you into everlasting life that is promised to us in our Lord Jesus Christ. But when fear takes possession of us and becomes a force, it, we're paralyzed. Paralyzed. Or instead of being paralyzed, it, it leads us to rash actions, ill-considered decisions, vicious actions, injustice. Fear leads us away from God, away from the, the way that our Lord Jesus Christ has taught us to live and behave and do things. It destroys us. And it's reality in the life of many people. And you know, there is so much fear abroad at the moment in in our community. There are people who are scared to go out. There are people who fear for their businesses. There are people who, who fear for their loved ones for elderly parents. There are people who fear being unemployed, people who fear what's going to happen to to the economy of our country and what the future is going to be like, as well as all those personal fears over, over health. You know, how many people have worried about something they thought was wrong with them when in the end there was nothing wrong? And yet that worry possessed them and and disabled them. Christians will read this Psalms, David's desire for the house of God. We will read that in a slightly different way from David. For David, he met God in a place. For us, we meet God when we're together in fellowship, like today. And it it is the Christian fellowship where we can talk to one another, counsel one another, pray together with one another. That is our strength. So David's strategy, first strategy, is to keep himself much in the presence of God. And then his second strategy is to listen to the promptings of his heart and remind himself of the friendship of God. My heart says of you, Seek his face, your face, Lord, I will seek. That's a wonderful urge, isn't it? When our heart says, seek God's face, pray, read the word, read a good Christian book. My heart says. You know, there's a modern mantra that says, follow your heart. Do what your heart tells you. And you know, that's a very dangerous mantra, a very dangerous way to think. Because doesn't Jesus say, for out of the heart come all kinds of evil things, murder, adultery, theft? Following your heart is all right if your heart is well guided. If your heart is filled with the Spirit of God. But advice just to follow your heart, whatever, can be a counsel to do what selfishness says. Whatever your appetites ask you to do. But when David says, my heart says, he is led of the Spirit. God is in him. And Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives I, do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So David's strategy is to seek the Lord. And when we seek and find the Lord, we find his peace. What is it Paul says in Philippians chapter 3? The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds. This is where we find deliverance from those fears that can overwhelm and dominate our lives. And David's third strategy in verses 11 to 14 is to live by trust in God's faithfulness even when he has to wait for God. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'll not just have to wait for it to eternity. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. That's something we, we, we're not good at, waiting. But we need to learn to wait in faith, trusting. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who or what shall I fear? Wait for the Lord. May not come immediately, but it comes. I had a young assistant working with me who could not get a call to a church. And this was what God told me to say to him, wait for the Lord. And he did. And eventually he found his way into a wonderful ministry. Fear, let me say it again, fear of what might happen is sin. It is faithlessness. It runs against what Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. I told you how when I was about 22, I was gripped by a fear that dominated me and I couldn't get rid of. And I found the way out of it by, by learning to commit myself completely to the Lord. Fear of a heart attack. Forty years later, I did have a heart attack. In fact, I've had two. But God brought me through them. God did wonderful things for me. God made amazing treatments available to me. And I stand here today still praising him, uh, blessing him, trying to serve him because he was faithful and he is faithful. Let not your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Let's pray. Lord, you are our light. You are our salvation. It is the living Lord Jesus Christ, the living God, who saves. Lord, grant us the grace to trust you and to say goodbye to these fears that so easily possess us. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. Give us faith to trust and to wait and to be at peace in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's pray briefly for others. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for every good thing in our lives. 
And yet, Lord, as we pray in the midst of, of this pandemic, we know that many people are fearful and anxious, and many people are, are actually suffering. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray for all those who have lost jobs, all those who are experiencing real want, people in other countries who earn their living as day wages, who have nothing. Lord, have mercy on our world, we pray. Bring this evil thing to an end, that the world, having learned from it, may be restored, and that the lives of those poor people who suffer may be sustained. Bless and guide, we pray, every agency, especially Christian agencies that work to meet those needs. And guide, we pray, those who are researching and seeking for vaccines and drugs against the COVID virus. Prosper their work, O oh God that quickly they may find a, a well-tested vaccine that can be given around the world. Lord, thank you for your blessings to this congregation during this time of vacancy. Thank you for, uh, for Nigel, for his care, for his work. And we pray, O oh God, um, that, that you will be with the Kirk Session and the congregation at this time as they come near to possibly making a call. We pray, Father, for your guidance for all those who are involved. We pray, Lord, that you will raise up for your people here a new pastor, leader, someone to minister the word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit to care for the, the congregation with love uh, and compassion, to be an inspiration to young and old alike, O oh God. Lord, build your church, we pray. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now our closing praise is, In Christ Alone My Hope is Found. Very appropriate.
And as we do so, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. And just finally, I, I will thank you, Alistair, for your words to us, and thank you uh, for God, for his word. I wish to update you on the vacancy process. As you know, uh, we interviewed prospective candidates to be the new minister last Saturday, and as it happened on Monday evening of this week. Just to take a step back, as you know, we have been on this journey for over a year now since Noble retired at the end of August 2019. As part of that process, we received nominations from members of the congregation. In total, we had 24 nominations and two independent applications, all of whom were considered by session. All those nominated were approached Following that process, we had seven applicants interested in being our minister here. One applicant withdrew before shortlisting, and one was not shortlisted. Of the remaining five, one withdrew during lockdown, as he had a strong sense of call to where he was already ministering. Four were therefore interviewed on Saturday and Monday, and of those, two were selected by Kirk Session as strong candidates to go forward for consideration by the congregation. The Vacancy Commission of Presbytery met on Tuesday and approved those two names, which then went forward to the Clerk of Assembly, who after consultation did not add any other name to that list. We therefore intended to announce this morning that those two candidates would come to preach on dates in October. On Thursday, one of those two candidates withdrew his name from the process on the basis that he did not feel a strong sense of God's call to proceed further through the process. We therefore have one remaining candidate who we had decided we wanted the congregation to hear. It was not our intention at any stage of this process to put forward a sole nominee to preach, and we cannot add another candidate at this stage. Session met again on Thursday night and we remain very happy for that remaining candidate to be heard by the congregation and to decide to proceed to issue a call. That candidate will therefore preach to the congregation on Sunday the 18th of October, and we plan to have a congregational meeting the following evening, Monday the 19th of October, to vote on whether to issue a call, and if so, whether that candidate has the support of us as a congregation together to be our new minister. It may be that we run two morning services on Sunday the 18th of October to, to allow as many of us as possible to hear him in the main church and details of that can follow nearer the time. All through this process, we have prayed continuously for God to lead us to the candidate of his choice and we continue to look to him now as a congregation together as we approach the 18th of October, and I would ask you to hear him in that spirit. Personally, I am very excited by the prospect of the new ministry and that God is leading us in this as a congregation to the person of his choice. We are not yet able to confirm the name of the candidate as it was only confirmed to him yesterday morning, and he needs to have conversations with his own Kirk Session and elders of his current congregation before we do so, and we wish to respect that. I expect, therefore, to be able to provide the name to you next Sunday, the 4th of October, which is two weeks in advance of the preaching date. We thank you for all your prayers and support throughout this process, and let us as a congregation continue to trust God together that he is at work and that he will continue to lead and guide us as a congregation into his future. Thank you.